So the pickups, uh, Mighty Might, the battery box says Fishman, and the preamp, uh, if I take off this uh, piece of foam tape, which is falling off anyway, uh, the, the, the preamp actually says Spectre, Spectre Bass. So I presume that means Stuart Spectre. Um, either that or maybe the, the baddies in the James Bond film. I don't know. Um, I think the battery box is original uh, because it's got some orange Barocca lacquer underneath it. Um, pickups, I'm not sure, but clearly someone's had a go at installing this preamp. It actually works and it actually sounds fine. But it's all pretty amateur. Uh, we've got um, all the wires held together with this twist tie, which looks like something that has come from a loaf of bread. Uh, we have soldered connections with masking tape on them. Uh, they are soldered okay. Uh, I don't know why you wouldn't just use a heat shrink. I'm not sure I really trust any of this wiring. I'm going to pull it all apart and have a look. I did notice, and I think I mentioned it in the last video, that the volume control is wired incorrectly. But first I need to do something about these connections and uh, this preamp, because I don't want it shorting I think I'm going to take out the whole lot and just double check all the soldering joints look okay. I've also noticed that there's a diode on the circuit board which is good news because this battery box, uh, you can actually install a battery accidentally around the wrong way um, and that's really not cool. Normally battery boxes are designed so that can't happen. They're sort of indexed with the size of the, the lugs on the top of the battery. I know there's a big sticker there, but hey, you know, it's if you're backstage and it's dark and you've got a flat battery you, and whatever, you know, these things do happen. Um, so yeah, I think I'm going to pull this whole lot out and uh, just redo the installation of this preamp. Okay, I'm going to butt in here because later on I took a closer look at the circuit board and the diode is actually wired in parallel with the battery. Uh, this is often done with pedals as a way of protecting the circuit if you accidentally use a 9 volt AC adapter instead of say a DC adapter. But in this context where the battery can actually be installed in reverse, Uh, the diode essentially becomes a short circuit um, and it'll only protect the circuit uh, for as long as it can survive um, having all of the battery's current dumped through it. Um, also the battery will get so hot um, you wouldn't be able to touch it and it'll be destroyed as well. I've never actually tried shorting a 9 volt battery with a silicon diode uh, but I'm guessing if the diode popped first and failed to an open circuit, then whatever was left of the battery voltage would go on and destroy the op-amp in the circuit as well. With a battery snap or a well-designed battery case, the chances of keeping the battery reversed while you go and plug the base back in are extremely slim, of course. But if you really want idiot-proof polarity protection, uh, a diode in series with the battery is a much better bet. Uh, I'll talk about this a bit more when I go and design the new preamp uh, in a future video. So, back to the show. So this volume knob is a problem. I can't pull it off. Sides at once. Oh, it's still really tight. Maybe it's been pushed on the wrong way. Whew. Oh, that's a real problem too. So let's just spaced this, spaced out this treble and base pot with sort of three of these flat washers, and that's why it's spinning. You really have to use shape proof washers. I'll show you that when I put it all back in. this actually I should check whether this shielding paint actually conducts. Well the shielding paint conducts not terribly well but it's okay. Unfortunately because the shielding paint doesn't come up over the routed lip for the electronics cover uh, none of this uh, shielding material is actually connected to earth 
Uh, so while I've got the electronics out, I'm actually going to put some copper tape in to help that out. I'm just going to put a single strip in and then I'm going to connect that strip up and over to these two screw holes. There's no real reason to do a full shielding job at this stage with copper tape, uh, partly because, yeah, this uh, uh, shielding paint actually does conduct and it should be fine, but also because I'm planning to do a refinish and, other, and more work on the electronics down the track. Uh, so this will be fine for a moment. Let me just get these wires out of the way. Press that along the top there, I can actually get a sense of how big to make this. So I'm just going to touch those two together with a little pool of solder. Honestly, it's probably overkill, but as a as a guitar wiring nerd, it just makes me feel better. <laughs> and I will do the same over here. So next I just have to remove some of this excess tape from the holes. Um, Stanley Blade makes short work of that. Uh, these little soldering joints aren't amazing. Yeah, that's no good. Uh, so I'm going to have to redo a few of these, I think. So I'm just going to piece of heat shrink. Put that on. And twist these together. matter of tinning those with a nice shiny solder joint. I need some light here too. Actually this is an earth wire and there's plenty left on it so I'm not going to bother. I'm actually going to take the jack out and uh, double check its soldering. Oh, and these, yeah, both of them are stripped. <laughs> All right, so whoever put the jack back in has stripped these two holes. Um, I've got a quick method for filling those before I put them, these screws back in. All right, so I've got the jack out. There's a couple of problems. The um, This red wire here, which is the output wire, that actually looks very much like a cold solder joint. Uh, and the other problem here is that the jack is spinning. And um, that's because it needs a shake-proof washer on the inside, a shake-proof washer. And that's one of those guys. Um, if a jack becomes loose, too often people are just tempted to uh, tighten them from the outside and the jack will spin um, and the wires will just rip off. So yeah, the, for jacks, pots, switches, um, the shake proof washers are more or less mandatory to be honest, uh, especially if you want to play gigs on your bass and, and, and have a really reliable instrument. Just going to lower that slightly. I'm tempted to put a switchcraft jack in, um, but uh, I think this is going to be okay. It actually looks like a pretty decent quality jack, even though it is plastic and these don't have a great reputation. Um, I'm going to leave it for the moment. So that's an 11mm socket. Yeah, another problem is that this football jack 
Well, that's what the Americans call them. Um, they call this a football plate or a football jack. Um, doesn't really follow the base bases contours properly. So, actually, I'm just gonna I'll put some tape on here because I don't want to scratch the plating. And bend this into shape so it follows the base better. Yeah, that's a bit better. I'm also going to squeeze this lug down as well, it seems to be catching on the top. That's fine. Unfortunately, I'll have to fill these holes though because they've been stripped out. The quickest way to do that is with my old toothpicks and super glue. Okay, I've got my little tack hammer, I've got my electronics side cutters. Uh, I've got safety specs. These are a really good idea when you're using super glue because the fumes will burn your eyes. Um, plus, the glue can actually spit out of the uh, hole when you tap your toothpick in. First, I'm just going to Cut my toothpick in half. Get some glue in there. And just push that in. Cut it to about three or four mil. And then it's just uh, just repeat the same process. Now you can just sort of nibble these pieces off nice and flush. Uh, the earth connection I'm going to remove because uh, the existing earth wire is easily long enough to go through. Again, I'll just clear that solder lug. Blue tack. <laughs> I've been soldering since I was a boy, and I've had all sorts of different gadgets for holding holding wires and everything. But honestly, I'm not too proud to admit I use blobs of blue tack because it's very very handy. And now. And now I can get in with my, with lots of control. The wire's not going to move while the while the the solder is molten. Um, again, I just linger for a sec to let that um, flux burn off. All right, so now I can line up this jack. Um, if I put it back in exactly the same place. Um, <laughs> You can see that uh, you can see the hole for the jack actually just starting to emerge from behind the football plate. So um, I'm going to line it up a bit better than that. I also want to make sure there's a bit of space around the jack as well. Okay, so right now the base is wired like this. We've got our two pickups. 
this is a dual gang blend control and this is the volume control and you can see that the wire from the blend control is actually soldered to the middle lug of the volume control. When the volume is all the way up uh, these two wires are short and you just get this value to earth as a load and I think that one is a 250k but the trouble with wiring a volume control like this is that as you turn the volume control down the resistance between your signal and earth diminishes uh, in fact when you have a volume control on half volume typically with a 250k audio pot this is about 40k so it essentially reduces the input impedance of the preamp to 40k and what that does is it, it squashes your tone um, rolls the treble off and, and yeah it doesn't sound great normally a volume control in this situation is wired like this And so no matter where you put the wiper, the load on the two, uh, the load on the pickups and the blend control stays at 250k. And this is really how volume controls should be wired and I don't really know why this one was wired incorrectly. Um, to be honest, when you have a base, an active base that doesn't have an active passive or switch or, or a preamp bypass, you really, probably better off uh, putting the volume control on the output and typically you'll run anything from a 10k to 25k but for the time being I'm going to leave the volume pot where it is but I'm going to reverse the wires but I want to show you that effect uh, with my scope so here's a frequency sweep of the bridge pickup, which is the sort of Stingray style pickup. I've got the blend control wound all the way back to solo that pickup, and I've got the volume control all the way up. And I'm taking the signal from the input of the preamp. Um, and yeah, you can see that around about 4 kilohertz looks like the resonant frequency of the, of the pickup. Um, so I'm guessing from that that the pickups actually wired in series, knowing what uh, Stingray pickups normally, how they normally behave in the treble range. I'm going to turn the volume control down to half, and we'll just compare that. I think uh, the grey line is the previous trace, and you can see the volumes turned down, but you can also see these lines aren't uh, parallel. There's actually a bigger drop in the treble. So what I'm going to do is actually swap those wires on the volume control so it's wired correctly and uh, we'll compare that. Once again the grey trace is the previous trace and with the pot still at half volume but wide as it should be you can see that the sweep of the pot has been affected slightly. Uh, the overall volume is just a hair lower but there's much less treble roll off around that resonance. For what it's worth wiring the pickup outputs to the wipers of the volume controls is what happens in a Fender Jazz Bass circuit and also really any bass or most basses that have two volume controls and it's done that way so that the volume controls on the surface seem to act independently but like any passive uh, circuit the controls are a little bit interactive and it's well it's not the full reason but it is part of the reason that your volume controls on a Fender Jazz have such a tonal um, uh, effect. Uh, maybe I'll talk about the VVT circuit in a little bit more detail in a future video. So now I think I'll rearrange these uh, leads and I can uh, run some frequency sweeps through this little Spectre preamp and we'll just work out where the treble and bass controls work. Okay, so here we've got the treble and bass controls set to their center clicks. So the preamp definitely doesn't have a flat frequency response. You can see there's a little inherent sort of bass boost. Um, and then a treble roll off after about 10k or actually probably a bit lower than that, about 8k, 7k. Let me save that plot and I'll crank the treble and I'll see where that works. With the treble control boosted all the way up, yeah, it actually boosts quite a bit of mid-range. Um, seems to peak around about 2 kilohertz. So here's a plot of the bass boost all the way up, creeping along, compared to the, uh, the center click response. It appears to have no uh, high pass filter, so that will boost all the way down to 20 hertz. Was that 14 dB? 
so there's the base cut all the way down fairly symmetrical to the base boost it's got about 16 dB of cut at 20 Hertz and finally with the treble pot all the way down we've got a roll off that starts around about 100 Hertz it's quite low actually it looks a bit like the passive tone cut on a P bass or something Okay, so now I can go ahead and just put all this back in. The first thing I need to do is insulate the preamp, and the easiest way to do that is just with a length of heat shrink, if I can get this on. Okay, so with a nut, all the way down, uh, it's still, it's not quite right, so I'm just going to put, I think I'll put two shake proof washers on this and see how that fits. That looks fine. So these look okay. There's just a couple of threads showing, uh, so they're obviously at the right height. Those shake-proof washers will stop them from turning. Um, so now when I put the knobs on, they sit nice and flush with the body and look right. So this stacked pot, or the, the control knobs for this stack pot, don't really fit well, and it's this ring's very narrow or very thin. Uh, when you put the top on, it sort of sits up, it doesn't really look right, so um, I could file or cut the top, uh, the top control, but I actually happen to have another one, which I think will fit just fine. That looks a lot better, so I think we'll go with that one. Okay, well I guess that looks a little, little bit better. And now when we put our electronics cover on, the shielding material on the back of this will be doing something uh, because of these little copper tabs. So it's just about time to do a final quick test on the electronics and the pickups. But before I do, I think I'll, um, I'm not so keen on this scrub screw being so long. So. I think the grub screw from the other knob might be a bit shorter and it's the same thread, so I think I'll swap it over. Yeah, they are the same thread and this guy's about 3mm shorter, so I think that's the one I'm going to use. Yeah, that's a lot better. So all that's left to do really now is just to do a quick test on the electronics. Without strings you can just tap the magnets. Uh, just keep your volume on your back amp down. that's fine. I think that'll do us for this video. I've got the neck pocket sorted. I've got the existing electronics sorted and reliable. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next installment.